I'll never forget, I believe it was uh, Dutch Sheets. I'm not for sure, Linda, you'll have to remind me. But she sent me a few years ago, or however long it's been, um, a, a, a great word that encouraged me. And he was on a video, and he was talking about me. Of course, he was talking about, I'm sure, other people as well. But he began to talk about the spinning that was going on. I never really thought about it then until I saw this message, how the spinning that goes on in our lives, how we can endure that spinning, that divine, that divine, what I would call it, probation. I want to say this morning that God is in control. God is in control. There is no doubt about it. It may not feel like God is in control. You may feel that things are out of control in your life, but I'm telling you, you're here this morning because God is telling you He is in control. He's in control of your finances. He's in control of your family. He's in control of everything in your life. And you have to believe that. You have to trust Him. Regardless how things appear, God is still in control. We can look at this world, and we can look at this nation even, and we can think of all you know the things that are happening, and we're like, how can, how can you say this morning with the war that's going on in Ukraine and, and the things that are happening, the starvation that is happening in all of these other nations in this world, the, the attack from Hamas and Hezbollah upon Jerusalem, and, and all of the threat of nuclear war, War and you have Chinese planes surrounding and preparing to take over Taiwan. And you're telling me, Pastor JC, that God is in control? Yes, I am telling you this. God is in control. But I want to say something about this because we need to look at this in a in a, really in an intelligent way you're very intelligent people and i would never try to say you're not but you're very intelligent and i know you understand the bible but i want us to kind of dissect this th- this thought about god being in control because there is a demonic humanistic teaching about chance in the body of christ and it, you may have not heard it necessarily talked as as chance but you may have heard it in other ways. People will say, well, you know, it just happens to be. Or people will say, well, it just, you know, there it was. I mean, it just came out of the blue. But we need to talk about this because we need to look how powerful God is. Because if chance exists, that means God doesn't exist. Now, I know some of you are thinking to yourself, well, sure. I, I mean, I know what it's like. I've, I live here. I mean, there's the chance that I a train passed by and I had to stop at the railroad tracks and wait. But see, God is in control even in that because you never know what could have happened on the other side of that railroad crossing. And so let's look at this and let's discuss this just for a few seconds. Chance means there is something that God doesn't or is, is not in control of. That's what chance is. And, they're, and, and in today's secular mindset, they're taking that thought, that ideology, and that principle, that, and trying to um, indoctrinate that in the minds of people. They're trying to prove that, hey, God is not in control. It stems even from the scientific field with a big bang theory by chance. Something exploded, and then here is the universe. It never happened that way. Let me tell you it happened that way. In the beginning, God created it. That is how this universe and everything that goes along with it, all of its atoms, all of its elements, everything that we can think of, that's what took place. Man thinks they are in control. With the artificial intelligence and developing some type of robot and some type of uh, computer, chat GPT, and boy, do I got a surprise for you. But when we begin to think, I think, well, we're the creator. And in fact, Hollywood has produced a movie called The Creator. But nothing is created by man. It's all been created by God. We have to understand that. You say, well, no, I can sit in front of my computer and I can pull up Photoshop or I can pull up Canva and I can make my slide and I can import these pictures. Who in the world gave that technology to man to begin with? It was God. 
And so a strategy of the enemy is to convince mankind that it is by chance you exist. You're here just by chance. See, what is happening, Sister Linda Sanford, is this. There is an attempt to redefine everything the Bible teaches. And this is the danger. When you redefine, you undermine. When you begin to redefine, especially when it comes to the values and the principles of God's Word, you are undermining God's Word. You are saying that you, your ideas, your knowledge is much greater than what the Bible could ever produce. And that's a dangerous place because when you undermine, you create a permissive culture to compromise. And that is where we're at. We're at this place where we're giving people today the permission to compromise. Compromise your beliefs. Com compromise your values. Compromise your stand with God, for God. Compromise what you, what you were taught in Sunday school. Compromise those, val those values. That's what happens when you begin to redefine things. We are a culture that has a full of information, but a culture that has done everything it can to redefine God's Word. That's, that's why I think it's so, so vital for you to get in God's Word, to dive into His Word. Listen, I know, <laughs> listen, I'm like you. I love this time of year. I love it. I love college football. I'm not big on the NFL. I call it not for long anyway, but I love college football, and I enjoy watching the LSU in Arkansas last night. I enjoyed I really thought we would pull it off and win. We had too many penalties, but nevertheless, I love that. But then I look, and I, I thought last Saturday, I spent several hours just sitting there studying whatever, but listening and watching the football game, and I thought, you know what? I should take that energy that I have when I'm watching a game and put it into God's Word. And if we will take that, I believe we will be much better because of it. Amen? Do you believe that? Say amen. Well, what does the Bible say about chance? Some of you have read the Bible. You know what it says. Look what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 11. He said, I returned and saw under the sea that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to the men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill. But look what it says. It says, but time and chance happeneth to them all. Well, there you go, Brother J.C. There it is. Chance right there. It's the Bible's talking about chance. Let's look at this. All right, Pastor Carl? You understand what I'm saying, right? Let's look at this a little deeper. This is what the commentary is about this. Adam's Clark's, Adam Clark's commentary says, it's not by swiftness nor by strength and valor that races are gained and battles won. God, put, come back on me, Caleb. God causes the lame often to take the, the prey, the prize, and so works that the weak overthrow the strong. Therefore, no man should confide in himself. All things are made under the government and at the disposal of God. God is in control. I agree with that commentary. That's why I included it in this subject today. These words, time and chance, the, the Hebrew word for time is E-T-H, et, and which means an opportunity. And the word for chance in the Hebrew is pega, P-E-G-A, and it means occurrence. And so Clark, he continues to say, Every man has what may be called time and space to act in, an opportunity to do a particular work. But in this time and opportunity, there is incident that may fall in and occurrence, what may meet and frustrate an attempt. These things should be wisely weighed and seriously balanced. For those four things belong to every human, now, I want you to pay attention to this because I believe this is so crucial. While you have time, seek an opportunity to do what is right. But calculate on hindrances and oppositions because time and opportunity have their incidents and occurrence. 
We have to realize this. It's, it was never by chance that Peter caught a fish with a coin in its mouth. See, I'm telling you this morning, God is in control. And if God tells you to go out to the Mississippi River and cast your net because your taxes are due next month, but there's going to be money in that catfish, get your nets ready. <laughs> get them mended because God is in control of your life. You believe that this morning? Shout hallelujah. It's the divine providence of God. We have to believe that and accept that. And if we could ever grasp the truth about God's divine providence, I believe it will help us to have a deeper trust in God for our lives. I want to grasp that. Before I walk out of these doors this morning, I want to know, Brother Jose, that God is in control. That he is in control of every aspect of our life. When we fully trust God, we can endure what I'm calling the divine probation of God. Divine probation. What is it? Here it is. Divine probation is the image of you and I stationed on the potter's wheel. That's divine probation. No, you're not in de detention. I was going to say D hall. You're not in detention. You're not, you're not shelved as Moses, which we're going to talk about Moses in a few moments, but you're not shelved in the backside of the desert for all those years. No, there's something going on in your life. God is doing something. He's orchestrating. He's the potter, and he has his hands on you, and you're on his wheel. And yes, you're spinning, and you feel like things are out of control, and you're like, please stop. But see, there's another part to the process of the potter pottery it is not completed until it is tested in the furnace right but we're talking about the wheel right now look what jeremiah 18 said oh by the way here's the life point our life point is this god has the right to touch your life he's the potter he's the creator he has the right to touch your life look at jeremiah 18 and verse 1 the word which came to Jeremiah, by the way, Jeremiah the prophet, this was Jesus' favorite prophet. He spoke about Jeremiah more than any other prophet. Now look what he says. Jeremiah writes, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, arise and go down to the potter's house and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels and the vessel that he had made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. God has the right to touch your life. He has every right to touch your life. Let's look at three truths about being stationed on the potter's wheel. Number one, how God makes a person. If you're following along in your notes, you want to write that down. Let's talk about how God makes a person. Listen. Even with that statement of God creating male and female, it is under attack. The gender uh, identity scandal is plaguing this, this culture. And it's, I mean, it, and who could, who could ever dream that this would happen? But it's following exactly the way God had already uh, predicted or said it would in the Bible. We're seeing these things. Read Romans 1. That gives you a great uh, understanding about where we're at. Now look, Jeremiah 18 and 3 said, Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. How many believe this morning God is working on you? How many can truly say, God, you're working on me? I mean, he is working on me. I'll tell you that right now. You know, we are all clay. We're all dirt. I mean, my best friend, he's gone in heaven now. He was my best man and, and, and my mentor. He's my best man in our wedding. I love Mark so much. I miss him so much. And I would kid with him, and I would say, I'd say things that were funny to him all the time. I said, uh, you, ever, you ever know how a dog, you know what a dog sounds like? when it barks and it has a lisp and he's like what and i go mark 
Mark, like that. And he would look at me, and he would always say, Jay, you're a dirt bag. Guess what? We're all dirt bags. We're all made of dirt. We're made of clay. A little boy came home from Sunday school, and he said to his mom, Pastor Carl, he said, Mom, the teacher said we're all made from dirt. And the mother said, well, yeah, that's, that's what the Bible teaches. We start out as dirt, and we end up as dirt. The little boy paused, and he said, well, Mom, this morning I looked under my bed, and I can't tell if someone is coming or someone's going. <laughs> we're all made of dirt. Every one of us. Just don't be a dirt devil, all right? <laughs> uh, you'll have to ask me about that story some other time. True story. Nevertheless, no human potter <laughs> ever made clay or dirt. No, ever, no human potter has ever made dirt. The, the potter has to borrow the dirt, the clay from God. He's the creator. No human has ever made clay or dirt. A potter who works with that clay or dirt has never heard that clay or dirt complain. When he goes out and he grabs that mud, that clay, that dirt, he plops it on there. He doesn't hear that clay, that dirt complain. Why did you put me here? Why I got to go back on this wheel again? I thought you were done with me. How are you ready for this one? How long is this going to take? <laughs> God help us. Yet, human clay and dirt complains to the heavenly potter constantly. No natural clay. That dirt, that potter got that mud. That No natural clay ever nailed Jesus to the cross, yet the human clay did. The fact about us human clay is we were created to yield to God. That's why he puts us on there. That's why he scoops us up. That's why he embraces us. That's what he sees. He's the master and he sees us and he is developing us. He has total access as we're on the wheel to look inside our vessel and to see what really is inside of our heart. What are our motives? What are we thinking? What is it that gets us driven? What gets our passion at a higher level? He has total access that we must yield to him when we the human clay when we're placed on a potter's wheel we're placed on there to yield to the potter's hands we're placed there for a purpose the potter's wheel symbolizes this it symbolizes the days of our lives that's what that potter's wheel is about divine probation the days of our lives. I like what the English poet Robert Browning, he wrote, he said, it's called the plastic dance of circumstance. The plastic dance. We're, in our circumstance, we're dancing, we're, we're being modified and molded and shaped on this potter's will. It's the days of our life. Listen, God has the right to touch your life. Number two, not only are we talking about how God makes a person, but number two, how life mars a person. 2 Corinthians 4, possibly my favorite chapter in the entire Bible. Verse 7 says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body of dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which, were, or which live are always delivered unto the death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. That's beautiful to think of that. See, you can agree with me this morning that life can dish out horrible things. How many can agree with me this about that? How many can agree people can be marred for life? My mother gave me some wisdom years ago. 
we're talking about death, we're talking about suicide, talking about tragedy, different topics. And she said, some people, JC, she says, some people never get over it. Some people can be marred for life. This is why it's so vital to keep your life in the hands of God. Keep your life in the hands of God. Putting your life in the hands of the potter, your failures never need to be final. Because, see, I may fail. He may have to pick me up and re report. See, in Jerusalem today, there's a place called the potter's field. And the potter's field is a place where the pot pottery didn't make it. The vessels didn't make it. They were just broken and they were thrown out and they just, and guess what's there also? Graves are there. And listen, that's not the way God ever intended for your life. He's just not taking you and molding you and shaping you and saying, well, I don't like this. Put you in a fire. You didn't make it. You didn't pass the test. Let's just get rid of it. That's not the way God created you. And when your life becomes marred or if your life becomes scarred, whatever happens, Know this, God still loves you and he has a plan for your life. Don't give up on God. Oliver Wendell Holmes, I want you to, I want you to see this. Many people die with their music still in them. Life has that propensity to put ugly things in your life. And then again, you may be here this morning and have a song in your heart, but nobody knows it. Nobody has heard it. Nobody's experienced it. And that's what he's saying. He says, too often, it's because they are always getting ready to live, but before they know it, time runs out. Don't let time run out. We all have been marred, everyone in this room. We've, we've been left with scars, everyone in this room has. But no scar is more important than the scars of Jesus. He was one that knelt at the Garden of Gethsemane, and he said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass for me. But he said, nevertheless, not my will but your will be done. See, God has the right to touch your life. Even when it came to Jesus, God has the right to touch your life. Number three, our last one, then we're going to close. How God mends a person. How God makes a person, how life mars a person, and how God mends a person. I talked about Moses. I was going to allude it to him. This is a great example because the life of Moses, if anybody knew anything about enduring divine probation, would be Moses and Joseph. For sure. Even Apostle Paul, you would say. But Moses is a great example. I like what D.L. Moody said. D.L. Moody said, Moses lived 120 years. Moses spent 40 years thinking he was somebody. He spent 40 years in the desert realizing he was a nobody. But he spent his last 40 years discovering what God can do with a somebody finds out. Without God, he is a nobody. God is here to mend the nobody and the somebodies. God loves us so much as I begin this message he loves you so much that he puts you on this potter's wheel I don't like the spinning as much as someone the next person does but I know this I'm in the hands of God I'm in his hands Robin is in the hands of God Vernon is in the hands of God. You, this morning, are in the hands of God. Yield to God. Luke 4, 18 and 19, 
Jesus in, interrupts the Shabbat service. He opens up Isaiah and he reads this. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. God has the right to touch your life. Well, how do I apply this to my life? I always ask you this. You know this by now. How do I go from description to prescription? How can I make this message the potter's will? How to endure divine probation? How can I make it count for life? Well, look at Jeremiah 18 and 4. <laughs> it said, the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. In the hand of the potter, it was marred. You know, God allows things to take place in our life to better us. You say, well, how can that happen? Why, if God is so good, why is there bad in this world? And <laughs> just to not get into the, all of the theology or even the apologetics of the Bible, let me just tell you this, bottom line, God is in control. God is in control. He has the right to touch your life. He has every reason to touch your life because he sees what you can become if you allow him to shape you and mold you. You remember years ago, I think it was 2016, 2015, remember this, Sister Charlotte? And we were talking about the shaking that was going on. We went into a season of shaking. This country did. And things shook. And then before you know it, COVID hit in 2019. But remember what the Lord said about why is there shaking? Why is there shaking? And God said, the shaking is to shape us. That's right. The shaking is to shape us, to mold us, Kevin, to shape us, to become who he wants us to become. I love this story. Show this photo, Caleb. 1968 Olympic marathon runner, John Stephen Aquari. He's from Tanzania. He was competing in the Olympics while he was running this marathon, 26 point whatever miles. Stephen cramped up early in a race and then he had a collision with another runner and dislo dislocated his knee at mile 11. Over one hour after the race, after the race had already finished, after the medal ceremony was already over, and it was dark, you can see from the picture, while most of the spectators had left, Stephen came limping in. When people asked him, the reporters, they gathered around him and asked him, well, why did you decide to finish the race? Stephen said, my country didn't send me to these Olympics to start the race. My country sent me to finish the race. This is what God is saying. He didn't put you on planet Earth just to start you. But he has a plan. And you are going to get to the finish line. I didn't come to this church years ago, leave a very, very great church, financially stable, great church to come here to, to Blyville to just start. I came here to finish, folks. You too. Think about this. And I think the best way to make true application of this message is to stay on the potter's wheel and finish this race. Philippians 1 and 6 says, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it to the day of Jesus Christ. What God starts, he will finish. What God starts, see, that's God. He's in control. I love what Paul writes to Timothy. Timothy is his successor, young pastor. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, he says, I fought a good fight. I have finished my course. 
I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Let's stand together in this room. What if we all determine this morning, I'm going to stay on the potter's wheel. I'm going to stay there until he's ready to mold and shape me. And then when the test comes, which is the oven, the fire, I know my God put me there. And he is the fourth man, brother <laughs> Carl, in the fire. And he's going to take me out. And I'm not going to have the smell of smoke. I'm not going to have any of this junk on me. I want to be the image that he intended me to become, the person, teeny, that he intended me to become. Bow your heads and your hearts with me this morning. Thank you so much, Father, for this word. With great determination, we're staying on a potter's will, and it's going to affect us in our family. It's going to affect us at our church and our job and our community in such a profound way because we choose this morning to stay where you've put us. While your head is bowed and your eyes are closed, you say, Pastor JC, this message has been for me. And I've been spinning. I've been enduring divine probation and I've been asking God, when, when, when? I need God to just give me that grace to stay put, to endure, to continue to have hope and great expectation that he is going to see me through. And when I leave, I know that I know that I know my life is better because of it. So Pastor JC, will you pray for me that I'll have the courage to stay? Hands are being raised all in this room. I give myself away. I'm, I'm calling marriages this morning that are being tested. I'm calling relationships with, with fathers and daughters, fathers and sons, mothers and daughters, mothers and sons, brothers and sisters, aunts, uncles. I'm calling them today. Shape us. I'm calling ministries, I'm calling careers, I'm calling students, I'm calling all, whosoever will, help us God, give us the courage and the strength to stay, give ourselves to you today, mold and shape us, let us become who you've called us to become. In Jesus' name. Now, Lord, there have been almost 100% hands raised in this room. People who are honest, full of integrity, very educated and wise, very spiritual. I'm praying for the crown of their head to the soles of their feet. I want you to raise your hands toward heaven. Let me pray with you right now. From the crown of their head to the soles of their feet, I send the word through the authority of your word. I send your word right now, strength, strength like never before, strength like never before, in Jesus' name. I feel the Lord touching you. I feel the Lord blessing you. Just surrender and yield. I, I dedicate my life. I commit my life to yield to you, God. Every area of my life, I yield it to you because you have the right to touch my life you have the right i give you full access i'm not hiding anything from you nothing can be hid from god i surrender all to you thank you god <laughs> let's give the lord a good hand clap his presence is so strong pastor carl will you come